Hi everyone, I'm Carla Salp. Welcome to Ole Grown. Last time on Ole Grown, we got to take a look at Tammy Shaughnessy's garden and got to see the beautiful flowers and one, some of the wonderful perennials that she had out there. Today we're going to take a look at my garden, which is mostly edible gardening. We've got some tomatoes here, some celery here. We're going to see what my garden looks like in June. Here we have some of the first things that I've started growing ever, and that was blueberries. Although this is a new one that I have. This is called a nocturne blueberry, and it's one of the darkest blueberries I've ever seen. Still a good size to the blueberry. Sometimes you'll find some darker blueberries, but they're, they're really small. It's very dark. And as you can see, like I do have around a lot of my plants in my pots, I have some strawberries as sort of a green, um, mulch in a sense so I have these are alpine strawberries and if you can see here they are uh, white and they are actually absolutely delicious as well <laughs> these are things that you will definitely not find in the grocery store they are extremely delicate oh that one just fell right off <laughs> they're delicate and delicious mmm they are so good but they are so soft that they really aren't good for commercial use because they can't be shipped anywhere. So this is something that you can grow at home that's basically a delicacy or a very high-end food and you will not be able to buy it anywhere, usually. Maybe at the farmer's market, maybe, but they, they are really squishy and so they don't transport well at all, uh, but they taste absolutely delicious. So I encourage you to try some white alpine strawberries. I also have the red, but I don't think they're as good as the white. The other benefit of the white alpine strawberry is that the birds don't know it's ripe. So they don't go after your white alpine strawberries because they don't know that they're ripe. The way to tell that an alpine, a white alpine strawberry is white, or is ripe rather, is that the seeds will start to turn a little bit brownish. Before they're ripe, they are a bit green. And when they start to turn, the seeds start to turn a little bit brownish, that's when the alpine strawberry is ripe. Also, they fall off pretty easily when they're ripe. So you know it's ripe and ready to go. In your mouth, of course. <laughs> So here we have a couple of trees actually that I have planted in pots. This, as you might have guessed, is a fig tree. It's about, it's going on its third year or so, and I haven't really gotten any fruit from it yet. We'll see how it goes. Um, par perhaps it doesn't like being grown in a pot or maybe it's just too young still. So we'll give it another few years here in the pot and see if it continues to do well. On this side, we have a mulberry bush or a mulberry tree. <laughs> um, it seems like it got a little bit of winter damage this year because it got so cold. And so I had to trim out some of the um, stems that had frozen back and also take out some of the leaves that had, were growing in the middle because it was really getting kind of bushy in there and not very good air circulation or growth. So I wanted to put energy into a few really good shoots and not a, not a bunch of little ones. And so I went in there and pruned some of those out. And again, down here we have more alpine strawberries. And then another couple of herbs. This one is called anise hip, hyssop and it tastes like licorice, like black licorice. So I love it to use to make tea, um, or just a kind of a refreshing water with some, um, a few leaves in it, you know, just cold. And it also puts off a lot of purple flowers that the pollinators just love. They will just swarm <laughs> to these purple flowers, just little tiny skipper-like butterfly type things, as well as the bees, the bumblebees, they all love the anise hyssop. So when that goes to flower, it's gonna be beautiful. I'm here between two more pots where I have trees growing. This one is a bush cherry tree, and it's, it's small and has smaller cherry type fruits 
on it. And again, we have more herbs and things around. We have a bunch of parsley, two different types of parsley in this pot, as well as more alpine strawberries. And over here to my left, I have a medlar tree. This is a rather, um, it's an old tree that has been around for centuries and isn't really used much anymore, but it produces a little fruit. And in order to eat it, you have to do something that's called bletting. And you have to basically let it sit out on the counter <laughs> for a couple of weeks. And it turns into sort of an applesauce-ish flavor. I hear, I haven't gotten any yet. Um, last year the deer browsed on this and, and pretty hard so I don't have any flowers this year but I've had them before. And then again more anise hyssop back here as well as alpine strawberries in this pot. Continuing around my deck here, we have more blueberries again. Again, this is the pink lemonade blueberry and it's really beautiful. You can see the um, very ends of it is actually pink already, which is really pretty. And then we have another Duke blueberry and the Nocturne blueberry again, more Alpine strawberries. But I do wanna mention one tip. If you're growing blueberries and all of a sudden they start shriveling up on the end after they get to about this stage where they're turning green and starting to grow and then they turn purple or blue and then shrivel up before they're mature. That's called mummy berry and it is a disease that is soil borne. And so the way to prevent that easily without any um, chemicals or um, products whatsoever is to put down some type of mulch underneath your blueberry plants to put a barrier between the soil and the blueberry plant itself. So in my pots here, I have bark chips and a pretty good layer so that keeps them clean and clear and keeps these berries from turning into little mummies, which is bad. <laughs> Um, and that's what happened the first year that I had blueberries. But then I found out what it was. There's a simple solution. Put down some mulch, you're good to go. So this is just coming into my garden that is gated off from the deer. Uh, this is a bit of a deer fence and pots built together that I got really cheap on Craigslist or Facebook or something like that, 25 bucks for the whole set. So I love it. It's a nice deep pot so I can grow lots of different things. And it has this fence on the back so I can grow things up. So vertical gardening is really a great um, tip when you are looking for more room to garden and you don't have that much space. So when you grow up, we can plant things closer together. Like these are all cucumber plants, a couple different kinds. Let's see, we have dragon's egg cucumber. That's a small sort of white cucumber that is about the size of an egg, a little bit bigger. And we have, let's see here. See, I have to label these things. I can't remember. Um, bait alpha cucumber. I don't even know if I said that right but it's supposed to be not bitter and are, you don't have to peel this cucumber. It has a sort of a thin skin. So these are gonna grow up and then the cucumbers will hang down and that will also help have some nice straight cucumbers and also prevent disease. Um, and then I started here in the front, while these are still small, some more of the Mizuna, which I really liked, the purple Mizuna that we planted a couple episodes ago, as well as some more arugula. So these will grow kind of quickly, and then they will be done by the time these get tall enough and are blocking the sun. One of my master gardener friends this past fall gave me some garlic. She wasn't sure what type it was, but from looking at it, I can tell you it is really healthy, good, strong growing garlic. So I have no idea what variety it is, but this is one of the joys of gardening. You get to share plants with your friends and also, uh, you know, they give you some, you give them some, and you come up with some gems. So this garlic is, um, you might be wondering, hey, these are kind of dying back here at the bottom. Is that bad? Um, no, that's actually um, how garlic matures. So these leaves are going to die back. And once we've got like three or four leaves down at the bottom that have died back, um, then we are going to be good to harvest these. So probably another couple of weeks or so before these are ready to harvest. But one thing you can harvest right now in my garden are what are called garlic scapes. So this is actually the flower that is coming 
up from the garlic. The garlic's gonna normally put on a flower, but we don't want it to do that, right? Because we want all of the plant's energy to go into the bulb, into the garlic, so that we have some nice large garlic. So what you can do is come in, bring your pruners, come down down and snip that garlic scape out of the garlic. And the other nice thing is that this is totally edible and absolutely delicious and also sort of expensive in the farmer's market or I don't know if I've ever even seen them in the stores, but uh, this is a garlic scape. And basically the way I prepare them is I dice, dice them up about the size of like a segment of green bean or so, um, as if you snap them apart. And I saute them in some oil and salt, pepper, garlic, onion, onion powder, something like that. Actually, I don't add garlic to garlic. <laughs> that would be too much, but um, it's absolutely delicious. To me, it's something like, uh, kind of like a garlicky green bean, but it's really good. So. Do yourself a favor, go out and clip off your garlic scapes and you'll get a bigger bulb and a delicious part of your um, next meal. Now we're getting to the raised bed portion of my garden. I wanna point out one thing first. You might notice there's this coppery looking thing going around the bottom and that is copper tape. And what that helps with is slugs. So they don't like to cross over that copper tape. So I've seen on my pots where I have the copper tape around where they will kind of, you'll see a slime trail going up and back down <laughs> from the copper tape. So it does work. Now this is not going to 100% exclude slugs, but it does help. So every little bit helps. <laughs> so that's one of my tricks for helping keep slugs out of a raised bed. If you have something where you can attach tape to it, like this is plastic, or if you have pots that you can attach it to, something like that. So what we have here, this is my first year growing amaranth. So this, excuse me, <laughs> it's in the amaranth family, but this is called orich, O-R-A-C-H. Both of these plants actually are, are orich, just different kinds. And this is sort of billed as a spinach substitute. So spinach, you know, once it even starts thinking about getting hot, spinach bolts. And so this is actually, it's actually a cool weather crop, but it is much more resistant to bolting than spinach. And so you can have, um, use these large leaves like you would spinach. I did have someone ask me if it tastes like spinach and I don't really think so, but <laughs> it's a good green to have, you know, throughout the summer while um, some of the other greens that only do well in the cooler weather, you can no longer have. So. You can use larger leaves like this, um, steam them up like you would spinach or saute them however you would. And then the smaller leaves are good for putting in salads. And I especially love using this more purpley one in salads because it's just so pretty and adds a lot of color. Down here by my knee, oh, I'm so excited. There's a ladybug in there. I love ladybugs. If you don't know, ladybugs are really good for your garden. They eat aphids, yay! But just let the, the um, ladybugs come in naturally. Don't bother buying them because uh, studies have found that they basically, once you come and release ladybugs in your yard, they might stay for a little bit and eat some aphids, but they're basically just going to leave and go to your neighbor's yard where there's a lot more aphids. So they will come in naturally on their own. So I don't encourage wasting money on buying them. Yeah, I never bought any and I've always get um, quite a few ladybugs around my yard. This is cilantro that I planted earlier this year. And unfortunately, while I was gone, it bolted. <laughs> cilantro is definitely a cool weather crop. It loves the cool weather, uh, does not like the warm weather, and it will bolt very easily. You can slow this down by getting a slow bolt. It's literally called slow bolt, so, slow bolt cilantro. Um, but I don't need this little corner space right here for a while, so I'm leaving this to flower because the pollinators will like this. So we've, we're helping the pollinators out a little bit, even with our bolting um, cilantro. Hiding down here, we have some lettuce that's growing. And one of the things that, oh, and another ladybug, yay. Um, one of the things that I do is I plant in especially lettuce in between things that are going to grow up bigger and we'll take a look later at our our cabbage and and kale that we planted in an earlier episode and see how large that is and basically all the 
the lettuce that I planted in between there is now gone. But here we still have some lettuce and actually the shade at this time of year is a good thing for lettuce. It'll help it, um, it'll take a little bit longer before this will bolt. So it'll last a little bit longer in the garden. Down here we have something new that's for me to, uh, for me to grow this year, and that's a purple pak choy. Actually, I've never grown any pak choy <laughs> at all, and I think I've eaten it once or twice <laughs> in my life. Um, except recently I just had the first one out of my garden and it was pretty darn good. I actually mixed it with the garlic scapes that we spoke about a few moments ago and it was absolutely delicious. The garlic scapes gave it a really nice flavor and we just sauteed that up and it was a really great way to enjoy that vegetable. And I will say though, it's a little bit disappointing when you eat it uh, cooked up, the purple does fade more or less back to green. So hiding behind the orange here, we have pole beans. They are growing up this little trellis thing that I have. And that's one of the nice things, again, about planting things close together if you don't have a lot of room. Again, we've got the vertical gardening. So these are planted, and if they were just staying down there, they wouldn't get enough sun to actually grow well. But they are growing up, and they're gonna get all the sunshine that they need to put on a lot of wonderful beans for us to enjoy this year. In one of our earlier episodes, we planted this whole area with cabbage and kale and a bunch of different types of lettuce and mizuna as well. As you can see now, we're down to just the cabbage and the kale. And this year, I'm not sure if it's a fertilizer I'm using or the compost, but I've had some of the best kale ever <laughs> out of this garden. I just picked this yesterday, so it's down to, you know, continuing to put out more um, leaves. And by the way, that's one of the great things about kale is you basically just pick the stems off of starting from the bottom up and it will continue to put out more and more leaves and you'll get nice fresh leaves for many months with the same kale plants. So that's one of the wonderful things about kale is it's not like a one and done, you know, you just cut it and it's done. You can just pick off those leaves from around and it'll keep putting out more and more leaves. Now I would suggest if you planted kale as early as I did this year, this is probably getting to be about the time of year where you want to start some more to go through the winter. So if you start it from seed now and then plant it out in July, it should be putting, um, producing leaves out for you through most of the winter in this area. So this is our cabbage that has that sort of purple hue to it. It's really beautiful. But one thing I noticed is this one right here is particularly tall. And I doubt actually that this one is going to make a cabbage head and I'll tell you why. Cabbage is um, a crop that usually will put, you know, it'll make a head one year and it overwinters and then it would put out the stalk um, for seed the next year. What happens was this year we put this out and then we got a really cold snap almost immediately after I planted it. And so some of this cabbage may think it's been through its winterization already, which I think is what's happening with this guy because it's not really forming a head and it's just bolting. You can see it's quite a bit taller than the other cabbages around here. So this one is probably not going to make a head. So what I'm going to end up doing with this one is cutting off the leaves and using them just like collard greens. This is a dwarf raspberry plant and I've had it for a few years and I love it. The raspberries taste absolutely delicious. I used to grow these in pots and now I have since moved them into, I see you, I see you, I see you. <laughs> this is a stink bug not a marmorated stink bug. I knew I saw him in there, so I started looking. I dropped him, dang it. That's a squisher for sure. <laughs> if you find any kind of stink bug, um, they should be squished. If it has a green belly, that's just a native one. But um, if it has a brown belly, I believe it is, you might wanna look further and see if it's a brown marmorated stink bug. And that should be reported through the Washington Invasive Species app. But the normal, um, stink bugs are just a pain, a normal level of pain. The brown marmorated stink bug is a much bigger pain. Um, but anyway, back to the raspberries. <laughs> uh, these are really delicious, thornless, they grow short, so these can go in a pot, but I decided to try and grow them here along the fence after I'd grown them in the pot for a little while. 
and see how they do down here. They seem to be doing okay. This is only their second year here, as in I just planted them here last year. So we've got a few raspberries going on, but I think probably next year will probably be the best year or a better year for these even. Now we've come to one of the most exciting parts of every summer garden, and that are that is the tomatoes. These are, I have 16 <laughs> different varieties of tomatoes that I'm growing, and you saw me pot some of these up in an earlier episode. As you can see, they're doing pretty well. We've had a decent year so far for tomatoes. It kind of went, I had the covers over these for hoop houses, um, uh, very briefly, it kind of went from being too cold to plant tomatoes to being too hot to have the, the hoop covers on. So those came off rel relatively quickly and the tomatoes are doing great. Now these ones here I started a little bit later than the ones on that side are the earliest ones and then over there I've got some even later ones. But I've got about 16 varieties of tomatoes. and. One of the things about tomatoes is that they are vines, so you always need to have some sort of support for them. This year I'm trying a couple of different types of support. One is basically this stake, this is a bamboo pole, and what I do is as the tomato grows up, I will put, um, I will attach it to the stake, and as it continues to grow taller, I'll attach it again here, here, and so on, and that will keep the plant upright. And then I have other types which are more the cage style types of tomato uh, cages. I don't like the ones that are, the ones you see mostly that are narrow at the bottom and wide at the top, which sort of makes sense for how the plant grows because it gets um, you know, bigger and wider at the top. However, it doesn't make sense for stability. <laughs> so those things have a tendency to fall over a lot. So mine are actually the inverse of that. They're the typical kind of round tomato cages, but they are wider at the bottom and more narrow at the top. And those are very steady. They're also, with, um, I invested in some very sturdy ones, so they're heavily built, they're not flimsy, and those will last me the rest of my life. So I think it's worth the investment, but those type are really hard to find. In fact, I couldn't find any this year. I did keep an eye out, but I didn't see any. So I normally add one or two each year just to keep the price spread out over years, but I couldn't find any this year, unfortunately. So I have 16 different types of tomatoes. And again, here we have interplanted lettuce. Doesn't this look beautiful? It's great. It's doing really well. And this is gonna be ready to harvest any day. And then um, that will just leave more room for these tomatoes to grow up and fill out this whole space. Now, I wanna talk about one other thing about tomatoes and that they tend to get a little bit diseased, usually starting toward the bottom, especially anything that has contact uh, with the soil or is near the soil. So I'm gonna pull out one here. If you find some diseased leaves on your tomatoes, the easiest thing to do is just break them off. So you can see this one is struggling a little bit. Um, I didn't necessarily have to remove it, but it's not the healthiest. And by removing unhealthy leaves, it keeps them, the, any diseases that might be there from spreading or to other healthy leaves. And tomatoes are very vigorous, so they enjoy pruning or they respond well to pruning. So this doesn't hurt it at all. Now we're in the most recently planted part of my raised beds. A lot of this was planted from seed and a couple of things like this pink celery were planted from transplants. Just as a note, this celery got a little bit of a late start and celery is, grows really slowly. <laughs> so you wanna make sure that you get your celery in. It's one of the first things I usually plant as a start. Um, you'll see some other celery in a minute that I did get planted in time and it's already um, to the point of harvest. So let's talk a little bit about what we have here. We have here some green beans, and this is actually um, slightly a misnomer because this is called the red swan green bean. And the red swan green bean is actually pink <laughs> or a reddish pink color. And so the bean itself is, <clears throat> is not green, but grows pink which is great because you can um, find them very easily in the beans <laughs> when they start coming on and being ready to be picked. Um, the other fun thing, if you know, kids will absolutely love these because you know they grow pink and when they're raw, they're pink or a reddish pink color. 
And then when you cook them, they turn back green. So if you have kids, they would definitely love the red swan green bean. Again, as I mentioned uh, a few moments ago, that we have a pink celery. This is also something new for me. I've never grown it. I think it's called Chinese pink celery. And it, I think the stems are a little bit skinnier than typical celery, but we'll find out. I've never tried it before, and we'll see if the taste is like your typical celery. I have no idea. We'll find out. That's one of the adventures of gardening. And then <clears throat> over here we have some red green onions. <laughs> Again, the sort of like bulb end of the onion is that typical like red onion look that you might see. And then the top is the green onion part. You're, you might be catching a, a theme here. This, I didn't realize this, but I planted all sort of reddish stuff <laughs> right here. And then um, the other thing is that I really like to plant things that you can't typically find in the grocery store. So, you know, here in Washington, we have, you know, thousands of farmers growing really good food. So what we get in the grocery store is really top quality food. So I like to grow things that I can't find in the grocery store. So a lot of the things that you'll see around here are things you cannot find in the grocery store. Behind the green onions, we have more beans. <laughs> we have a Christmas pole bean, which um, grows up these uh, trellises. And it's sort of, it's a really large bean. And this one you don't um, grow for, you know, the flesh of the bean, you're actually growing for the bean seed. So you're, uh, they're kind of like, um, butter beans, I guess, but they're they're colored and so I'm looking forward to giving that a try Behind the Christmas pole beans. I have runner beans and runner beans I grew for the first time last year and they're one of my favorite things now They will grow up these trellises and they'll put out these beautiful um, Pink flowers and then they'll have a bean that comes obviously afterwards now I was really growing them for the flowers last year and I wasn't sure whether the runner beans would actually be edible themselves or not but it turns out they are. They're actually really good. It's sort of a meaty, there's a lot of flesh to that bean. They're really good young. <laughs> so you do want to eat them while they're pretty young, but um, if you can also eat them when they get older, but they get a little bit tough and they'll have a huge um, string in the bean that you'll definitely have to remove because it's just not edible. It's really fibrous, um, but it's still good. And I even found that some of the oldest beans, I basically was eating just the inside of the bean, not the outside or the string. Um, it's sort of like eating a artichoke leaf, <laughs> a little bit like that, but it was still good. So, but definitely the younger bean was the best. And um, that was Sylvia, if you, if you saw her. Here, Sylvia, here, kitty, kitty, kitty. This is the celery that was planted on time. This is a right, your standard celery. It's pretty much is the celery that you would find in the grocery store. But I do like growing it because, um, I don't know if you can see, but it's so much greener when you grow it yourself. I don't know what that means, but I just think it looks beautiful and I just really appreciate a nice green celery. And so this stuff, we actually have started to harvest a few. I might just pull one off yeah, here's a good size one. Um, I started to harvest a few of these and apparently right now celery is very expensive in the grocery store. I didn't know, but I posted what I called my first peanut butter worthy stock. And um, a few of my friends were talking about how expensive celery was in the, in the garden and my sister said it's like growing a $5 bill. So I've got a few $5 bills out here. I've got, oh, I don't know, 20, 50 bucks right here. <laughs> but um, celery is one of those things, again, that you can harvest from the outside and let it continue to grow from the inside. And then on the far to left of mine, uh, left of me there, I have some scarlet kale growing. So that is more of a uh, yeah, another type of kale, but it has a more of a purple hue to it. My husband loves kale, so we grow a lot of kale. And in fact, I harvested so much kale yesterday. Let's see, I used it in smoothies. I made, um, I made a kale salad, kind of a kale superfood salad. I also, um, I dried some that I'm gonna use sort of like dried parsley. And then we also um, blanched some and froze some and chopped it up that I can use in soups and stews throughout the winter. So that's going to be great.
I hope you enjoyed taking a look at what my garden looks like in June. Thanks for watching everyone. As always, you can follow us at Ole Grown TV on YouTube, Facebook, and on Instagram. And we want to take a look at your garden too. If you want to be on Ole Grown, send us an email at olegrowntv at gmail.com. Thanks everyone. Have a great day.